Good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to the Department of Medicine uh, Rutgers Robert Johnson Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, today, uh, just like always, our Grand Rounds will be uh, recorded and posted live on our Department of Medicine YouTube website. Um, also on the Department of website, we've listed all of our upcoming Grand Rounds including next week's Grand Rounds, which is going to be our first morbidity and mortality conference of the year. For today's session, the CME text code is 11981. I'll post that in the chat uh, once we get started. For today's session, uh, just like all of our sessions, everyone's going to be muted, but uh, we encourage as much dialogue and uh, chat as possible. You can post any questions or comments in the chat and I will uh, moderate the Q&A session later on with Dr. O. Uh, we are incredibly lucky today to have Dr. Esther O here with us. Dr. O obtained her medical degree from Chicago Medical School and then later a PhD in clinical investigation at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. After her internal medicine residency and chief resident year at the University of Illinois at Chicago, she did a clinical and research fellowship in the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology at Johns Hopkins, where she's remained. She's currently an associate professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology. In addition to the Department of Medicine, she also holds, holds appointments in the Departments of Pathology and Psychiatry, the School of Nursing, and the School of Public Health. Her main clinical focus is evaluation and treatment of cognitive impairment and associated disorders, including mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's dementia, dementia of Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, and her topic for today, delirium. Her research focus is on Alzheimer's disease and related disorders with an emphasis on team science to collaborate extensively with investigators from different disciplines to achieve the goal of improving health outcomes for older adults. Her presentation today will discuss the long-term consequences of delirium and how we can prevent, identify, and treat delirium across care settings. Thank you very much, Dr. O, for being with us. Great, thank you so much. It's such a great pleasure and privilege for me to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna do screen share at this point. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure you can see my slides. Great. So I don't have any relevant disclosures. So I wanna start off with the patient's story. So this was an article that was published in Wall Street Journal in February of 2020. It said the surgical complication that can damage your brain. And it was a story about Bill and Judy Borton and Mrs. Borton um, died from complications of Alzheimer's disease in September of tw um, uh, 2019. So the article says, Bill Borden had no idea his wife's colorectal surgery could affect her mind. But a day later, Judy Borton couldn't remember her birthday or who the president was. She was experiencing symptoms of delirium, a confused state that is common in elderly patients after surgery or during intensive care stays. The delirium went away after a few days, but Mrs. Borton's cognitive abilities, which were already impaired, declined rapidly afterwards, says her husband who's 84 and lives in Bethesda, Maryland. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease a year later and died at age 81 from complications of the disease in September. Her doctor suspects a delirium contributed to Mrs. Borton's cognitive decline. So Mrs. Borton was my patient. Uh, she, her husband sought um, help at our memory clinic after um, about a year of struggling um, um, after her colorectal surgery. She did have um, diagnosis of what's called mild cognitive impairment prior to her surgery, but she was very functional. And it took all a very different cognitive trajectory after her surgery, followed by delirium. So delirium is an acute disorder of attention and cognition. It's really defined by disturbance of consciousness. So reduced clarity of awareness of the environment with the review's ability to focus, sustain, or shift attention. In the United States, five older persons develop delirium every minute, and the, really the cost to the person and caregivers and society is very great. But I do want to point out to you that um, when I look at the Medline Plus definition of delirium, it says 
Delirium is most often caused by physical or mental illness and is usually temporary and reversible. So if it's a temporary and reversible condition, why do we care? It's gonna go away, our patients will get better and there'll be no long-term consequences. So today I'm here to share with you um, the literature, my experience on what happens to patients who suffer delirium, especially in acute care settings, so in, in uh, medicine floors, in surgical settings, and what happens to those patients in the long term and why that might be happening, how we can detect delirium efficiently, how we can prevent it and treat it. So delirium is often unrecognized, so it's or underrecognized, uh, and really we are not doing no no better job than we were in 2000 to 2001, where we were detecting about 55 to 70 percent of delirium cases. It's not much better, and it's mostly due to lack of active screening. And what we're missing is called what's called hypoactive delirium, which I would like to explain to you in a minute. And often patients who have delirium are mistaken for having depression or dementia. And it is possible that they have both conditions. Another thing that makes it really difficult is that the symptoms tend to fluctuate. So for example, you might go see a patient in the morning, they're alert, they're conversant. And when you come back in the afternoon, they're very, very confused. So there's a fluctuation. So if you don't see your patients uh, frequently or check with the nursing staff, you might be missing a delirium episode. So just to take a couple of minutes to explain hyper and hypoactive delirium. So everyone recognizes hyperactive delirium. So these are patients who get phone calls all saying, doctor, you have to do something about this patient. They're pulling out their IVs. They've already hit a staff member. So this is very easily recognizable. But what I wanna let you know is that that's actually the minority of the cases. Only about 25% of all delirium cases are hyperactive. And the rest, about 75% are hypoactive or what I call quiet delirium. Decreased activity, action speeds, uh, decreased speed of speech, amount of speech, listlessness, withdrawal. As a matter of fact, if you're an intern, you might have already seen this patient this morning. You walked into Mrs. Smith's room and you, we, you know, we do all the talking. So did you sleep okay? Are you in pain? Oh, no, good. All righty, well, you know, I'm gonna come back later uh, with my attending and my team and I will see you later, okay? And we step out and Mrs. Smith is laying there with her coverlet all the way up to her chins. She's alert, but she is so confused that she doesn't even know who she is and she doesn't even know where she is. And that is hypoactive delirium. And often it's missed because we don't do active delirium screening. Now, it was mentioned that delirium is very temporary, but I'm here to tell you that it's actually often long lasting and very persistent. Here's a study by Dr. Ed Marcantonia from Harvard, and this is a study on hip fracture population where there's a really high incidence of delirium. So in his study, there was 41% occurrence of delirium. And among those who had delirium, about 40% had delirium at the time of discharge. So as you know, although we like to think that we actually delirium is resolved before patients get discharged home to a subacute facility, when in fact they, are, they actually have persistent delirium. And they actually came back for one month follow-up with orthopedic um, physicians and 31% of those who were discharged with delirium still had delirium at that time. And a six month follow-up time, about 6% still had delirium. And delirium is associated with poor outcomes and high healthcare costs. So what happens is that patients who come from home are hospitalized and experience delirium, often they lose their independence. So you might send them to subacute facility for rehab, but never, they never quite make it home. So there's a higher rate of institutionalization, increased medical complications during hospitalization, including falls, which is a big safety concern and incident dementia. And this is where really the focus has been in the past five years or so, and higher mortality. And all that really combined results into about $164 billion in annual healthcare expenditure. So here's an example of study of really what happens to patients who um, really experience delirium. And this is an intensive care unit, so ICU study. 
Uh, the name of the study was called Brain ICU, and this took place at Vanderbilt, uh, which I consider to be a premier institution in ICU delirium research. So they had about over 800 patients, uh, both medical and surgical ICU combined, with respiratory failure, cardiogenic shock, or septic shock. So very, very ill patients. Now, obviously, no one elects to go into ICU settings, so none of these patients had in-depth neuropsychological testing before they were hospitalized. Um, but you, there's a tool, tool called IQ code where you can kind of assess their baseline cognitive function. And according to that measure, about 6% may have had evidence of pre-existing cognitive impairment. So this is to say is that most of the patients who were in this study were deemed to be kind of to be normal. But as you know, ICU um, you know, has a lot of um, delirium incidents. So about 74% experienced delirium during hospital stay. So what happened to these people? So at three month follow-up, 40% of these patients who were in this study had cognitive scores that were comparable to moderate traumatic brain injury. And 26% had cognitive scores that were comparable to having Alzheimer's disease. And please remember that only about 6% had evidence of cognitive impairment prior to uh, being admitted to the ICU. And it was very persistent at 12 month follow-up, 34% had cognitive scores comparable to moderate TBI and 24% had cognitive scores com comparable to AD or Alzheimer's disease. And in this study, a longer duration of delirium was independently associated with worse global and executive function. So, and they have done actually two, about two to three year follow-up. And what they find is that a lot of these patients who were uh, gainfully employed before um, either their accident or critical illness um, actually were never actually, um, many of them could not return to their former jobs and probably mostly because of the cognitive impairment that they had um, experienced. So what this is showing is that if you look at the top where it says green bar showing normal range of what they have should have, have scored and bottom, somebody who might be at the Alzheimer's disease range, you can see that many of these patients were scoring somewhere between what's called mild cognitive impairment. So usually that's defined as one to two standard deviation um, of the um, norm for age, um, uh, sex, and education adjusted values, and traumatic brain injury. And you might say, well, you know, many of these patients could have been older, and so maybe they had something that was unrecognized, and, you know, critical illness and a lot of traumatic events could have caused precipitation of cognitive impairment. But what's surprising is that even in younger population, so patients who are 49 and um, younger, experience the same phenomenon. So the point is that being in the ICU, having experienced delirium and longer duration of delirium can have a long lasting impact. And a lot of times we take care of these patients in the ICU and we never really see them on outpatient basis. So we don't realize what happens to these patients. So what could be going on when somebody is experiencing delirium? So this is just a hypothetical cartoon of what might happen. And this is really focused on inflammation. The reason why we don't know too much about delirium in terms of pathophysiology is one, obviously delirium is not a disease, it's a syndrome. Also, one of the cardinal features of delirium is attention or inattention. And it's really hard to make a mouse model of uh, basically and test you know, their attention skills. So there's a lot of barriers, but there's some investigators who are investigating really the pathophysiology based on animal models of delirium. But what we think is happening is that let's say somebody is undergoing surgery, um, had, um, you know, when was in a car accident, something traumatic. So there's this inflammation in the periphery. And that basically goes into the bloodstream and it goes into the brain. And you may say, well, you know, we have something called broadband barrier that should protect our brain. But when you are older, especially, there's damage to the blood brain barrier. And certainly there are other things, older age, inflammation, exposure to drugs that can also damage and a lot of inflammatory factors can actually seep through the brain, through the blood-brain barrier. And what happens is that activates what's called microglial cell. I think a microglial cell is the kind of the cleanup crew of the brain. So it's actually trying to do good. It's trying to clean up all the bad things that's in your brain. Unfortunately, when they get activated, they also release inflammatory mediators. So in a way, there's even more inflammation in the brain. And so the hypothesis is that you know, the inflammation causes some neuronal dysfunction, 
And if the delirium duration or severity is very short or very uh, much less lessened, then you might be able to recover and there's a recovery of um, neurons. But when that's persistent or the delirium or the inflammation is severe, that actually causes permanent neuronal damage and perhaps causes long-term cognition, as I had mentioned to you in the previous slides, or even perhaps dementia. So here's a biomarker study, kind of really trying to buttress um, this hypothesis. So this is a study, what's called successful aging after um, elective surgery or stages. This was also done at Harvard. And so what they did was they had an um, elective surgical population, uh, what was considered to be really uh, major surgeries. And they basically did a you know, proteomic study. And in, in, in the beginning, it was kind of um, discovery. So they just threw everything in and said, you know, let's see what comes up positive. And um, I'm sure all of you know what C reactive protein or CRP is. It's a marker of inflammation. And that really came up at the top and they validated by doing an ELISA assay. So what this is showing is that before surgery, so pre-op, you can see that patients who ended up having delirium after surgery, and that's indicated by the gray bar, already had some inflammation and higher degree of inflammation compared to those who did not experience delirium. But that difference is even more remarkable after surgery, so POD2, post-operative 2. So there's evidence that there are patients who might have underlying inflammation that's at a higher risk for developing delirium, but definitely having delirium after surgery, at least in this case, is associated with a higher level of inflammation. Now, what happens with the brain? It's always really hard to detect um, brain damage because obviously peripheral blood markers really have not been adequate in assessing neural injury until fairly recently. So there is the marker called NFL or neurofilament light. It's basically in your um, intermediate um, fiber that's um, kind of a uh, uh, core of the axons. So the good thing about this NFL biomarker is that although traditionally we've always looked at the cerebral spinal fluid as a marker uh, or uh, in detecting biomarkers of neuronal injury, now we have a blood biomarker that actually correlates very well with what's happening in the brain. So NFL is being used for um, biomarker studies of traumatic brain injury, uh, neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, frontal temporal dementia, and in this case, delirium. So what this is showing is that people who, have, who did not experience delirium, so non-delirious compared to delirious, they had a much higher difference or change in NFL. So indication that there might've been a greater brain damage, so to speak, from baseline to POD1 or post-operative day one. And we talked about delirium severity. So often we think of it as, well, if somebody had delirium, so that's bad, right? And it is bad, but actually what we are now understanding is that actually it's a delirium severity. So worse the delirium severity, the worse the consequences. And so what this study is showing, this is also from the SAGES population, is that when you look at the blood biomarker of NFL or neuronal injury, and DRS is basically basically delirium severity indicator or score. And what this is basically showing on the right-hand side is that if you have a really high delirium severity score, the change in neural injury biomarker is greater. So from compared to preoperative state to postoperative state. So the delirium severity, the worse it is, perhaps you're sustaining more brain injury. So this is also basically, this is just to show you that Delirium is not just a harmless condition that's temporary and reversible. There may be permanent damage that's maybe ongoing. And this is just a schematic diagram showing that, well, if you have a relatively healthy brain, um, it's gonna take a lot. So if you have low vulnerability, uh, so let's say a 40-year-old who comes in with uh, maybe motor vehicle accidents, so really great trauma. So it's gonna take a lot to push somebody over to have a delirium episode. But if you have a lot of older adults, especially in our medicine services where they might have underlying Alzheimer's disease or maybe unrecognized dementia and their brain is quite damaged, it really is not gonna take very much to push them over. So it could be a very simple infection and they might become delirious. And I think what's really important as internists that we can appreciate is that, although I'm an internist who you know, practices the memory clinic, so I do tend to be brain centric, so to speak, but as a geriatrician, I'm very cognizant of the fact that, well, our brain is attached to the rest of our body. And 
So what's happening in the rest of the body is going to influence what's happening in our brain. And so it's not just a brain disease. It's not the fact that just they have Alzheimer's disease, but they have Alzheimer's disease and they have really bad cardiovascular disease. And all those things are really put them at a higher risk for de developing delirium. So um, I think one of the things that happened, I was just um, talking with Dr. Cohen um, and I just came off a medicine service um, um, after after doing for two weeks. And we saw a lot of patients with delirium. And what we tend to do usually, including myself, is that we tend to look for kind of the low hanging fruit. We do a UA. Oh, well, you know, there's very few bacteria, but there's, you know, oh, well, there's enough, you know, white, white cells and uh, leukocyte esterase positive. So I think it's UTI. So the thing about delirium is that it's usually multifactorial. So the traditional teaching is that if you found one cause one reason why your patient might be delirious, the next thing you should do is look for another reason. It's multiple reasons. It's not just the dirty urine, it's the medications they've be given to our patients, it's the trauma that they've undergone, it's all of those things, the stress and everything. And so how do we um, you know, improve delirium outcomes? So first is really um, you know, doing a very targeted screening and I just want to introduce just a couple of tools to you today. So, um, you know, what we're um, trying to um, show here is what's called confusion assessment method. Um, and although I'm not going to go into the details of the method, if you can think of screening tools as doing an MMSC or MOCA for um, dementia um, diagnosis. So obviously you wouldn't just look at an MMSC score and say, oh, you have dementia or you have Alzheimer's disease. Same thing with confusion assessment method and other methods that I'm gonna um, basically mention. We are the doctors. We're gonna use our clinical skills to detect and diagnose delirium, but this is just a helpful way of just kind of gauging, you know, where is the patient at? So the confusion assessment method, there's four criteria and you need to have the, uh, the two core criteria, which is first acute onset and fluctuating course. We talked about fluctuating course. You're gonna see them in the morning, they might be fine, they might not be so fine in the afternoon. Acute onset. So often where the confusion arises is we have patients who has history of dementia or some cognitive impairment, and we just dismiss it as, oh, this is that's just their dementia syndrome. And so this is where you actually have to talk to an informant, and that might be their family members and say, you know, I do understand your mother has, you know, uh, baseline diagnosis of vascular dementia, but does this look like your mom? And they will tell you, yeah, my mom has dementia, but this is not my mother. She is different. And so this is where you're basically thinking, oh, this might be more than just dementia. This might be delirium. So there's a change from baseline. Another thing is inattention. So there are patients who might be, you know, very much alert, but as you're talking to them, they kind of drift off or they start falling asleep. And it's not because you're really boring. It could be, but it's because they're very inattentive. And having seen thousands and thousands of dementia patients, I can tell you that although, you know, patients, definitely patients with dementia can be uh, tangential, they're usually very attentive. So there's the difference. And then presence of at least one item from three and four of the criteria. So disorganized thinking, not knowing where they are, altered level of consciousness. So they might be a little bit uh, somnolent, drowsy, and so on. So the, we talked about the confusion assessment method as a screening tool. There's what's called three minute confusion assessment method. It's just a very, very systematic way of filling in the CAM assessment tool. And these are all tools that you can actually download uh, from, um, American Geriatric Society website. One trick that I wanna teach you today is that there's two questions that you can actually ask that might be um, sensitive to kind of give you a clue as to whether somebody might be delirious. So it's called ultra brief cam. And what they've done is basically take out two questions that was basically really the highest need with highest sensitivity. And that is months of the year backwards and what is a day of the week. So when I'm rounding and I don't have too much time, I use, usually try to um, test somebody's attention by asking them, can you recite the months of the year backwards starting with December? What comes before December? And I find that um, most people are at least willing to give it a try. So 
I usually don't test people with math questions like, you know, can you subtract seven from 100? Because well, everybody gets really angry when I ask about math questions. So months of the year backwards, days of the week, um, usually no one has problems starting off, but you will see that patients who have delirium would not be able to complete this. There's another tool called 4AT, which is also available on, um, uh, on their website as well. So I would say confusion assessment method and 4AT are some of the really commonly used tools. And, but if you're at the bedside, I would you know, ask you to kind of try the months of the year backwards and what is the day of the week. Okay, so syndromal delirium. So, um, so basically some of the symptoms of delirium may be present, but may not meet the criteria for CAM or DSM criteria. So meaning, you know, if you score 26 out of 30 on MMSE, does that mean you don't have cognitive impairment? So that's not what it means, right? So basically it's like saying, well, you know, understanding that many of our diseases are actually on a continuum. So even if we define hypertension as perhaps 140 over 90, if your blood pressure is 139 over 89, that doesn't mean they don't have high blood pressure. It just means that it doesn't meet a certain you know, threshold. So just be aware that subsyndromal delirium would exist. And you, as a clinician, have to have a very high suspicion. And these folks, because they tend to go, once again, under the radar, have just as poor prognosis as patients who have very florid delirium as well. Okay. So intervention. So I want to really emphasize uh, prevention of delirium because it is estimated that we can prevent about 30 to 40% of delirium. So delirium prevention. So there's a, um, you know, how do we go about doing this? Is it medication? Is there something else that we can do? So Cochrane Review on Interventions for Preventing Delirium in Hospital as non-ICU patients basically shows that there is strong evidence to support multi-component non-pharmacological interventions. And one of the ones that I would, I would like to introduce to you today is what's called Hospital Elder Life Program or HELP. And it emphasizes early mobilization, oral hydration, sleep enhancement, orientation, therapeutic activities, and hearing and vision optimization. So basically targeting six risk factors for intervention. So if you're targeting cognitive impairment. So these, these are the things that patients come in with, you know, and experience sleep deprivation, immobility, visual impairment, hearing impairment, and dehydration. And the original study uh, where they've shown very um, good outcomes, it was deliver delivered by trained volunteers. So these are just the, you know, the summary of what the delirium prevention you know, methods um, um, consist of, you know, orientation and activities, fluid repletion, and all those things that we talked about. And you might say, you know, this seems really, you know, um, time consuming and really complex. You know, do we have to do all these things? Well, you know, as a geriatrician, I'm here to tell you that care for older adults, very, very complex. And here's a quote by H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there's a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. Our older adults are very, very, very complex. And so we talked about multiple factors leading to brain insult. So, so a very, very complex syndrome like delirium will actually require all those things that I just had mentioned in order to prevent. And what's really difficult is that, as you know, these measures that we're really talking about, you know, would require if we don't, especially in, during COVID time when we can't have volunteers and we can't have family members by bedside, we might assist in, in need assistance from, you know, patient safety attendants or your GNAs or CNAs or nursing staff. And unfortunately what happens is that manpower, so to speak, is a non-reimbursable activity by Medicare. So we can charge uh, for a wound vac, but we can't charge for something that could actually prevent the wound, such as early mobilization. So that's where the one of the big barriers in delirium prevention is. So this multi-component non-pharmacological intervention to reduce, reduce delirium or help has reduced delirium incidence by 44%. This is a systematic review. And actually, because patients who have delirium tend to fall, it reduces falls by 64%. So this, is, can, be, this can be a really, really powerful tool. And some people have looked into um, using antipsychotics for prevention of delirium. And basically there's no difference in between haloperidol um, and versus placebo. These are randomized controlled trials in terms of lowering delirium incidence 
shortening the duration, or even hospital length of stay or mortality. So there's no place for using antipsychotics for prevention of delirium. So the American Jersey Society Practice Guideline uh, says that you know, we should use multi-component non-pharmacological intervention for prevention, obviously educational programs for all learners as well as the staff members, um, medical evaluations, uh, pain, focusing on pain management, reducing and avoiding opioids. And in terms of treatment, so we just talked about prevention, in terms of treatment, once again, just focusing on, we don't really have too much control over premorbid factors or factors related to presenting illness because it has already occurred. But I do still believe that there's a lot of place where we can make a difference. So post-admission factors, you know, we talked about pain, infection, um, invasive devices, you know, how often do patients come from ED, you know, with the Foley and we just kind of leave them in there, uh, precipitating a UTI that was unnecessary. Immobility, we're so afraid of our patients falling that they're often tethered to the bed with a bed alarm. We should really be talking about active mobilization, not immobilization of our patients. We know that early PTOT can make a big difference in critical um, outcomes in our patients. Um, and, you know, we talked about opioids, polypharmacy, sleep deprivation. I do find that hospitals to be the most noisy place where you can be. And if you just fall asleep, we just make sure that you don't have, you don't get into the REM sleep by, you know, taking vitals or, you know, doing other procedures um, to our patients, um, environmental factors, and so on. Now, I want to spend some time talking about antipsychotics because I think often this is like the kind of the go-to for, you know, our patients, unfortunately. So we've done another systematic review that's very, very comprehensive. And, you know, these are randomized controlled trials of very high um, quality. We do not see any difference between haloperidol versus placebo or second generation antipsychotics. Uh, frequently used, you know, medications might be something like Seroquel, you know, olanzapine, uh, you know, risperidone compared to placebo. These medications make no difference in shortening, de shortening delirium duration, um, sedation status, hospital length of stay, or mortality. I want to talk to you a little bit about the sedation status. So we might say to ourselves, well, okay, you know, it might not, you know, make the delirium better, but at least, you know, they're agitated. And so we can sedate them, you know, by giving this medication. So we actually looked at the outcome of sedation status as a side effect of these medications. And we could not find any difference between antipsychotics and placebo in terms of sedation status, meaning it doesn't make them more sedated even. And unfortunately, what happens is that when these medications are started in intensive care unit or in the hospital, they go home or they go to the subacute facilities with the medications. So here's a retrospective study from Belgium showing that one in five patients were discharged from the hospital with antipsychotics if they received antipsychotics in the ICU. Outside of the context of delirium, we do know that antipsychotics are highly associated with stroke, higher mortality, and we've shown in Alzheimer's disease population that it actually makes the cognition worse if you're an antipsychotics. And that's the reason why the FDA has black box warning on these medications. And it's not helpful, yet we keep using them. So this is just a, um, a summary of the study that I talked about, a single center retrospective observation study showing that um, you know, patients who are starting the medication inpatient tend to go home with the medication. So we have to be very careful. I do want to spend some time talking about delirium and terminally ill. We do have patients who um, the focus of the hospitalization transitions really from acute medicine to focusing more on, um, you know, um, palliative care and before transitioning to inpatient and hospice or otherwise. Um, usually these patients do tend to have high prevalence of delirium. So uh, prevalence of delirium prior to death is about 75% medium, anywhere from 58 to 88%. Um, you know, and when you actually survey um, patients and actually physicians, mental awareness, so having clear mind at the end of their life is ranked much higher by patients, almost like 92% compared to physicians, uh, 65%. But there's always, um, you know, it's really difficult to kind of balance these two. So one is that uh, potential benefit is 
you know, obviously, you know, at the end of life, um, the patients uh, want to and want to interact with their family members. So there's a clearance of mind, you know, delirium, you know, resolution. So, so treatment or partial treatment of underlying precipitan uh, for delirium may improve cognition and, you know, definitely minimize, you know, delirium symptoms. And actually, you know, may allow the patient to return home prior to their death, um, may offer, you know, survival benefit. However, it comes at a cost when you do extensive delirium treatment, as well as, you know, workup. Um, and it might require inpatient uh, care for this. Um, may also not be aligned with the uh, person's expressed preferences and wishes, how much workup they might have wanted at the end of their life. They might have just want to be in a more palliative um, in a setting. And also, you know, family may not be prepared for, you know, uh, grave or poor prognosis. So treatment for delirium at the end of life is no different than delirium at any stage of life. Um, so non-pharmacological methods are definitely recommended. Here's an important study that was done by uh, Mira Agar, she's an Australian, and published in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2017. So this was the use of antipsychotics uh, for hospice and palliative care settings. And, you know, I do send patients to palliative care settings, uh, both from acute um, inpatient unit, as well as from my memory um, clinic. So I do see that a lot of hospices do use um, antipsychotics for um, symptom management. So here's a study where they did randomized control trial study of Haldol, Haloperidol versus placebo, and Risperidol, Risperidol versus placebo. And Haldol and Risperidon compared to placebo actually caused worse delirium symptoms. It caused patients to have longer delirium duration. And if you were in the Haldol group in this hospice palliative care settings, it basically resulted in higher mortality compared to placebo. So I think, you know, even though it's frequently used, it may not be the best thing for our patients. So I wanna just uh, summarize. Um, so delirium is associated with highly prevalent and is associated in high, um, and is highly prevalent and persistent in older adults. It is associated with neuronal damage. Delirium is associated with poor clinical outcomes, including long-term cognitive impairment, falls and other outcomes. And it's very costly to the society. And there's very little evidence for using antipsychotics for prevention or treatment of delirium. But I wanna, you know, really the take home message is that delirium is preventable. We can prevent about 30 to 40% of delirium. And what we, we know it works is that it's multi-component, non-pharmacological prevention has the best evidence for delirium prevention. So I know I talked about a lot of topics today. So if you have additional questions, um, here's my email uh, for later. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. O. There's a, a, a couple questions that are coming up in the in the chat. Um, the first is, what would you recommend to do for a hyperactive, delirious patient that is pulling their lines and getting out of bed? And would you ever use restraints? Yeah, so thank you. So now that I presented my slides, I want to put on my uh, clinician who just got off service, <laughs> two-week service. Um, had a lot of patients, you know, who were delirious on the floor. Um, you know, I talked about evidence today, and I also understand that we need to be practical. So I did have a patient who um, was uh, fairly uh, physically aggressive and harmed two staff members and did uh, pull IV IVs out. And um, I didn't really go into the details of the American Geriatric Society recommendation, but that is really the only instance when we actually recommend antipsychotics. Um, so one is that I would, here's, here's some tips and tricks that I would like to share with you today. So often we tend to reach out for um, IM or IV, antipsychotics or benzodiazepines, like, you know, lorazepam and so on. Usually what happens is that I find that patients are completely um, so sedated that it's really hard to wake them up. And once again, the delirium duration is much longer. So if a patient is harmful to others and or to themselves, I think that is one time when we can say that we, can, we should use some pharmacological intervention. 
And so what I try to do is use some oral formulations that are not pill or capsule format. So um, olanzapine and uh, risperidone come in disintegrating tablets. So literally you would just pop them in their mouth. It will just melt. Risperidone also comes in oral liquid formulation. So I tend to use a very, very low dose. So for risperidone, I think I use like 0 0.25 milligrams um, and it was a disintegrating tablet and it worked great the following day when the patient once again became very agitated and started becoming physically aggressive. So, so those are kind of things that even though, you know, we talked about, you know, not being able to, th th there's really not no evidence for using these medications for either, you know, hyper or hypoactive delirium when somebody, you know, um, physically aggressive and could be harmful to others. I think there is a place for that. I do not recommend physical restraints. Uh, once again, I think the best thing is even before we reach for antipsychotics, if we can have someone, so, you know, I think uh, patient safety attendants, I think you know, we used to call them sitters. If you could have somebody who can actually orient the patient, I think that would be best. Um, I don't remember, you know, um, physical restraints being used uh, in recent years, but I, I don't know if that's used in the ICU settings. I don't attend in the ICU. Uh, but I definitely would not um, recommend physical restraints. Um, it can be very harmful to the patients. Thank you. Uh, and when sedation is necessary, uh, for example, to let family members sleep, what kind of sedation should be used? Um, so maybe <laughs> if, if you could clarify, um, the question, what do you mean by when family members need to sleep? Um, is, is it more about uh, sleep disorder um, question? I, oh, so I may, think- so uh, I, can, I can jump in, this was my question. So this is about a patient obviously who's at home and who has um, a, a problem with being awake all night and keeping the caregiver awake all night. And um, I, I found that a very difficult thing to handle. Yes. Um, so, you know, I'm a dementia expert. So this is like number one thing that comes up, you know, in terms of, you know, patient, you know, caregivers complaints and, you know, phone calls. So what I would say is um, you can use trazodone. So trazodone is the only medication, at least in RCT um, context. So especially with Alzheimer's disease, uh, you know, patients who have Alzheimer's disease and sleep disorders that has shown to be um, helpful. So, and I actually just used in the inpatient setting as well for somebody who was um, undergoing alcohol withdrawal as well. So instead of reaching for antipsychotics, you know, I had used 25 milligrams of, you know, uh, trazodone at bedtime. And, you know, that usually works well. Um, and certainly, you know, it comes in a 50 milligram uh, pill. So you can cut it in half to start with. And I just usually tell the, you know, caregivers, if the half pill doesn't work, you can go up to um, whole pill. So I don't, try to exceed more than a hundred milligrams. Um, usually, you know, with 25 or 50, it seems to be helpful. Another thing that can be really helpful is mirtazapine or Remeron. So the, the sedative or the, the kind of the hypnotic impact of this medication comes at a lower dose. So with Remeron, you can start with 7.5 milligrams. So I think the lowest dose is 15 milligrams. So once again, half a pill and then about 15 milligrams. So I would try those two first, trazodone um, and um, Remeron. Okay, thank you. Um, and then in terms of, you know, um, helping to reorient our patients who are, um, who have delirium in the hospital, um, any evidence behind hospital design, things from single rooms to carpet and mood lighting, which could be helpful. Yeah, I think all of those things. Um, so I think, you know, having a roommate, so, you know, where I am, where I just attended, we still have um, two, two people in one room. Uh, it's a shared room and obviously they have private rooms as well. I think it can be, it can be sometimes helpful because, you know, they kind of strike up friendship and they start talking to each other and that can be, you know, kind of orienting in itself. Single room, obviously, you know, during COVID time when I was, working on the COVID units, I think that's what I found was really this isolation sometimes actually made delirium episodes much worse. 
And I think, um, so in terms of design, I think single rooms are great because, you know, maybe your roommate does not have the TV on, so you can have a, you know, quiet setting, but then you're kind of losing that external stimuli. We have tried carpets um, on our floors, and I think, you know, um, it was quieter, definitely, um, and they were using very, like, um, uh, soft or very, you know, lower noise uh, vacuum cleaners before, but somehow the, now the carpet's gone. I think it's because it traps dirt or something like that. So, but I think definitely environment is very important. So even outside of the context of delirium, when we really think about behavioral management of patients, older adults, whether it's due to their underlying dementia or even delirium episode, you know, I always think about direct and indirect routes. When I say direct, Obviously there's some brain pathology and some chemical imbalance that is manifesting in somebody's behavior. But there is indirect routes, so environmental and caregiver aspects of basically escalating the symptoms. So environment, it could be both lack of activity and too much activity. So a lot of noise tends to aggravate or upset patients so uh, I'll just give you an example. Even though we think that you know grandchildren are great for um, you know older adults, sometimes when you have dementia or you know kind of confusion, sometimes um, you know having lots of little kids running around can be very upsetting to the patients. But when there's not enough activity, number one, I would say reason why patients become very um, agitated in any setting is because there's nothing to do; they're bored. So what we do is actually as a behavioral intervention, giving them things to do. Um, it could be, um, you know, crossword puzzles, if, if that's what they like to do. It's whatever they want to do. Um, it could be folding laundry. Uh, so just giving them something to do, I think it's very, very important. And it will definitely de-escalate the behavioral problems. So there's an environmental factor. And then there's a the caregiver issue. You know, obviously, I'm really talking about delirium in inpatient settings. But if you're talking about home settings, it's, you know, we often what we see is that the escalation of behavior really sometimes comes from caregivers who are just really exhausted and have um, shorter temper um, and less tolerance for the behavior that they used to tolerate before. And then they start, you know, basically kind of um, arguing or things like that and the symptoms escalate. So I, you know, I really appreciate your question because we often think of, you know, all these behavioral problems that our older adults have as just a brain problem, but it's actually the brain problem and it's an environmental problem and it's a basically a caregiver or, you know, people around them. So those things are very important. So I think I don't have a clear answer, but I think those things really need to be thought through. Thank you. I was going to ask, uh, you, you touched on it about uh, the impact of COVID. And I think, um, you know, specifically the, the virus and the, the illness, uh, as well as the social isolation that patients had um, when they were hospitalized, and then long-term COVID, long-term effects from people who had COVID. Yeah, so um, we have what's called PACT or post-acute, I mean, uh, yeah, um, post-acute COVID um, unit um, study that we have um, going, supposed to acute, yeah, COVID team um, clinic. So it's really through pulmonary critical care, but um, I have an NIH supplement to study long COVID in these um, individuals. Um, so these are people who come in because they have persistent, um, you know, uh, symptoms, and it could include, you know, brain fog, as they've been calling them. Um, and what we do find is that, you know, really across all ages, we do definitely see, you know, cognitive impairment, what we don't have is their baseline because obviously, you know, COVID was, you know, it's still very new and, you know, they hadn't had, you know, um, kind of a baseline neuropsychological testing, but we do see that there's definitely cognitive impairment that's persistent. You know, where delirium comes is that, you know, we do, we did see really high incidence of delirium in patients who, you know, had COVID. One is that it's, that it's an infection. So they're in a very inflamed state. We talked about the importance of inflammation and delirium, and it's a setting that they're in. And we talked about you know, vision and hearing um, issues as well. So if you think about being in an isolated room and it's very quiet or they might have TV, but you know, for the most part, um, you know, I think there's avoidance uh, for a very good reason. Um, 
to go into patients' rooms, you know, very frequently. And when we do, um, we either have, you know, like a, a, you know, N95 Papper or, you know, Drager. And so our communication is very limited. So they are kind of deprived of this like sensory stimulation. And so we do find that, and we did find that, you know, definitely, you know, it, it exacerbated the delirium symptoms. We saw a lot of delirium um, in the COVID unit. Thank you very much. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, and this is incredibly timely, like we mentioned, like we discussed before, for all of our new interns that uh, have come in this year. Uh, if there are any other questions that anybody wants to post in the chat, uh, we'll give it another minute or two before uh, we thank Dr. O for her time with us. Looks like Dr. Steinberg, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. I figured I would just talk. I'm, I'm not a very fast typist. So thank you very much, Dr. O. That was a great presentation. Can I ask a non-symptom question? I don't know if you've been part of in, in say development of like a help program, if you've ever been at, in the role of trying to convince a hospital or a health system that they should fund that kind of program and it's worthwhile. And if you had any suggestions um, as to what might be the best strategy to try to convince them that it's uh, something they should be doing. Yes, thank you very much. So I would like to just kind of uh, mention one thing, which is called, um, there's a um, kind of a, uh, I don't know if movement is the right word, but um, initiatives, um, it's called Age-Friendly Health Systems. It was started by the Hartford Foundation. And now it's obviously, you know, um, has an alliance with the IHI um, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So basically what it is, is that um, Hartford Foundation, uh, which is a foundation really, about translating, you know, what we know, what we know in our heads, in our evidence to implementation. So such, such thing as health program into community hospitals and academia and so on. So they have about 25% of the all hospital systems in the United States already signed up with this. And they're working on four principles. Uh, so four M's and one of them is called mentation and that's dementia, depression and delirium. So along that line, where they've been trying to make a case for this is, so this is just kind of harkening back to how do you make an economic case for this, is that this movement of age-friendly healthcare system, where they've shown the most cost savings is with delirium reduction, usually with length of stay and so on. So what I would recommend is that if you go to the Hartford Foundation or IHI website and just type in age-friendly health systems, they actually have different PDFs on you know, how do you make an economic case for starting the age-friendly health system? But you'll see that all the examples are from reduction of delirium, and that's how they've been able to convince hospitals to uh, sort of buy in, so to speak. And I think this is the really the most difficult thing about, you know, just anything that we do as physicians is that, you know, we have the evidence and we know what the right thing to do is that often, and, and I find this in myself as well, is that it's so hard to implement what we know to do good for our patients. And, you know, so I think this is where I think we really need to spend more time really refining because a lot of the great programs, what happens is that as soon as the grant, as soon as the grant, um, you know, you know uh, cycles over or there's no more funding, hospitals tend to pull the programs out saying, well, you don't have money to do this, no matter, you know, what the outcome was. So I think, you know, um, we as physicians need to be advocate for our patients. You know, they rely on us to provide best care for them. And so I would say that um, definitely, you know, um, we have to figure out how delirium prevention methods like help can, um, you know, be, uh, I don't know if sold is the right word, but really presented to the hospital system to show them that, um, really, you know, the, at foremost, this is what we need to do for our patients but also that it will save the healthcare system, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, cost savings, you know, at the end of it as well. So the age-friendly health system um, would be the best place to go in terms of website and finding out, you know, what the um, economic case for this is. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. You're welcome. So Thanks. one thing that I would like to just say is that, um, you know, I think I just can't emphasize enough, especially for interns, is that, you know, as you do your rotations and if you're in internal medicine wards, if you're in the intensive care unit, 
you know, if you walk in and you get the handoff from your, you know, co-intern and, you know, Mrs. Smith is already, you know, delirious, you know, like, well, you know, I guess we can't do really the prevention. I implore you not to walk away or give up on this patient because what I've shown you today is that just by, you know, if you take some time to reduce, you know, polypharmacy, some other insults and reduce their delirium severity and duration, you'll probably never see this patient again after they're discharged, but I have no doubt that you would have helped them greatly. So that's the only thing I want to say to the interns. Thanks. Um, we do have another, um, a great question um, from uh, one of our psychiatrists who's on the, our grand rounds today. Um, so as a psychiatrist, half of my consults on the inpatient setting was for delirium. Um, typically it was an agitated delirium case as you described using low-dose risperidol when violent and trazodone for insomnia gave excellent results. To avoid long-term antipsychotic use, uh, he ordered um, PRN risperidol only for five days. Do you support short-term medication orders like that? Yeah, definitely. I think it needs, so I think what it is, is obviously good medication reconciliation before discharge, as well as we do admissions. Um, you know, PRNs, um, you know, I, I try to avoid them only because, so I, ha I have to give a two part answer. So one is that I am a very much of a realist. So I do know that, um, you know, if you don't have PRNs, especially in long-term care settings, uh, what happens is if patients are difficult, there's no medication written, literally they're 911 away from just being shipped off to a hospital. So I do leave some PRNs so that they have some tools to work with the patients, but yes, I mean, I guess, you know, the fact that you would say that just for five days or, you know, two days or whatever, very limited time, I think probably is the wisest course of action if the patient is, you know, uh, very aggressive towards others and is, you know, harmful. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Dr. O, for um, this fantastic, comprehensive presentation on delirium. It's going to be really helpful for all of us, not especially our interns, but for all of us. Thank you everybody for being here today and we'll see you next week for the morbidity and mortality grand rounds, the first one of the year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.